Hola, bon dia. Carl Munson here with the Good Morning Portugal live stream. And fantastic to have with me today, George Branco, uh, whose uh, reports I've been reading out uh, here on the live stream covering the facts and figures, uh, more reliably covering the um, the black and white stuff. Uh, I'm more of a grey person and I can't help but sort of inject a bit of an opinion into things. But I'm so glad you're here, George. I wanted to thank you for what you're doing. Good morning to you. Good morning, Carl. Thanks so much for having me. And how are you? Yeah, re- really good, relatively good, I guess. Um, yeah. How are you doing this morning? I'm well, thank you. And it's the same sort of caveat for me that uh, we are um, living in the strangest of times. You're, you're providing a fabulous service about that, which I'll put on the screen now. Um, news about the coronavirus in Portugal, written in English and delivered to your inbox daily. Um, what what possessed you to do such a thing? Um, look, to be honest, I, I wasn't really sure if it was something that people were were necessarily going to be going to be wanting or needing. Um, I'm a journalist. I've been working as a journalist for about ten years, um, and so for that, I'm for that reason, I'm really passionate about the idea of people getting um, regular, easy to understand access to proper information, which obviously at a time like this is even more important. You see so much, um, like so much absolutely ridiculous, uh, wrong, uh, wrong information floating around on social networks and in WhatsApp groups at the moment that it's really important to be able to access that. And if you're a foreigner in Portugal, there's no kind of, um, uh, national English language newspaper that, that's going out and um, and covering this sort of stuff, or if there is, I haven't I haven't found it. Um, so I basically originally I actually got in touch with one of the um, with one of the bigger news uh, newspapers here, Publico, and asked them if I could get involved in any sort of if they wanted to provide a translation service, then I could maybe sub edit it in English or something like that. Um, that they were obviously a bit too uh, overburdened with covering the current crisis, um, so I didn't have staff for it. Um, and I decided oh, I may as well just set up this newsletter and and see if people, if it was something that that people were chasing, and it seems like they are so far at least. Absolutely, yeah. I'm really grateful for it. Alongside um, Craig Morfit and Safe Communities Portugal. I think you guys are doing a really good job. Like, as I say before, you know, it's easy to get into the speculation and opinion, and it's great to have people around like you who will just sort of stick to the detail. Um, so should we, should we give folks a taste of, of what you, you do and uh, have a look at um, your report from yesterday, uh, which is a Monday, of course. Welcome to Monday after another weekend of numbers remaining pretty steady. Unfortunately, it looks like Friday's particularly tiny jump in cases, just 181 new confirmations for an increase of about 1% was a one-off, but we're still holding steady. For 10 days now, new cases have been hovering around 500 to 750, which authorities have described as a plateau today. Also brings the smallest increase in deaths, 21 uh, over the month. So, yeah, uh, you're, you, the great thing about you, George, I think, is that you're looking at the pattern here, aren't you? And you produce this really good graphic each time. Um, your, your sense of this is that we are in a plateau, and this is exactly what the lockdown is designed to do, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, I want to really stress that it's not, it's not my sense of it. Like I'm, I'm very much just taking, um, uh, taking what's being said by the authorities and what's being reported, um, what's being reported here in the Portuguese news as well. Um, uh, because yeah, obviously, um, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not an expert on these things. So I'm, I'm really just doing a straight kind of summary of, of what I'm seeing in the local news because I'm, I'm I'm not able to be out there sort of asking the questions of the of the health director general and and that sort of thing. Um, but that's that's their sense anyway. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, yeah, no, thank you for that caveat. And that's 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 the strange thing. I mean, you're you're bringing such a discipline to this, which a lot of news people don't anymore. Um, you're a rare breed, I would say. Where, where, where's your journalism training from? You 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 learnt your skill in Australia, did you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think I think there is there there um there are a lot more um kind of straight down the line journalists uh, than you might think, but sometimes the uh, the ones that are that are maybe on the edge of the edge of being journalists that are more commentators uh, make a bit more noise. So it's, it's, it's the ones that are sort of doing straight reporting can can end up being a bit hidden, unfortunately. 
Yes, it's the system, isn't it? Not the journalists, I suppose. That's the problem. Where the empty vessels make loud noise and then they get promoted to the top of uh, yeah of, of the popularity. Very interesting observation there. So uh, we've been in this now a month of, of the state of emergency into the third phase of it. What's new? What's next? This is um, it's, for you, those of you who've just joined us. This is George Branco's uh, service. Yeah, probably best to tell us where people can find this, uh, George, and how they can subscribe to it, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, yeah, that's a, a good idea. Um, so if you go to georgebranco.substack.com, yeah. um, that's where you can find the basic information. You can either sign up to it there as a newsletter service um, or you can just click through and um, and read it, read individually each day if, if you don't want yet another um, bit of email cluttering up your, cluttering up your inbox, which I totally <laughs> understand. That's very considerate of you. Um, so we've been in lockdown for a month now, as you say here, since midnight on March the 19th. Bit of a blur now, isn't it? We're into the third 15-day state of emergency period and not much has changed or will change until May. The government has lifted the month-long sanitary fence blocking all but the most essential movement in and out of Avar. Interesting thing with Avar, isn't it, is that that will probably go down in the history books as a, a place of you know research and a, a sort of spotlight showcase place of how this all worked out what, what's your sense of what's gone on in Avar? i mean it seems like basically that once that sanitary fence has come in uh, everyone's really everyone's really realized after that initial very serious outbreak just just how serious the issue was and they've managed to get things under control um just reading uh, just reading this piece from observador uh they do sort of talk to a few people in the township there and uh, it's very obvious that uh, that people are people are, I guess, a bit scared by by what's happened there, and also fearful is not the right word, but but cautious perhaps that if they don't continue to to kind of follow all the normal social distancing things, um, uh, keep keep from meeting each other as much as possible, then there could be another kind of resurgence there, and they're, they're, for that reason they're sort of aware that they could end up with these sort of restrictions again um, if things do go south. So I, I think they're, they're taking the situation there ex extremely seriously from, from what I can tell um, reading these local reports. Yes, indeed. Okay. And then we move to Lisbon, of course, because you've, um, you've covered how a hundred, more than a hundred guests test positive after Lisbon hostel, it was evacuated. President of the Arayosh uh, I don't know if I pronounced that right. We were talking about learning Portuguese earlier on, weren't we? Maybe we returned to that. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the Junta de Freguesia de Araos in Lisbon, I ran at that and I might have got away with it, uh, wants a hotel inspected after more than 100 guests tested positive to COVID-19, uh, reports the uh, Diario de Notias, Noticias. Um, what, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, what, how are you, as someone who lives in Lisbon, how are you feeling the impact of, of the lack of tourism and, and how do you think confidence will be in tourism when when we get beyond this or move you know move further down the line? Yeah, um, look, I, I don't want to speculate too much. Um, yeah, but from no, 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 it's okay. I mean, I think I think we can say um, pretty pretty comfortably, unfortunately, that it's going to have a huge impact. Um, I'm trying to remember the uh, the figures, but there was. There was some stats. The the um the kind of Portuguese uh, uh, um I guess treasury is not the right word, but the one of the kind of monetary agencies here put out some figures, some uh, projections for the impact that um this virus would have, and I think they calculated something like a twenty five percent drop in tourism would uh just on its own hit GDP by like. A significant few percentage points, um, which kind of shows. I, I'm not going to say the exact figures because I can't remember them off the top of my head, but yes. it, it just shows how important tourism is here. And obviously, if, if you if you don't have people coming in, um, if you don't have people coming in from any other country for it's been a month already, um, yeah, we could only assume that it's going to be a huge impact. And yeah, I mean, I, personally, I'm I'm a little bit worried about what what is going to happen i hope i hope that people can kind of get back on their feet um after this after this passes or begins to pass 
Yeah. And are you coming across anything interesting in terms of innovation for the future or are you focusing on what's actually happening now in terms of your sort of investigative journalism? Well, I definitely, I definitely wouldn't call it investigative journalism because um, I really, this, this really is just a, um, I don't like, I don't, I really don't want to take credit for the work that's being done by the local journos. I'm, okay. I really am just kind of summarizing what they're doing. Um, okay. The only thing, the only thing that I'm doing outside of that is, is looking at the figures all day and, and kind of giving that summary up the top of, um, of what's been happening. But I, I'm, I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear about some more um, kind of positive stuff and and things that people are things that people are starting to go forward. There's a lot of um, I don't know about in tourism. It might be a bit too early, but it's forced a lot of businesses to go um, to go online. Um, even a lot of like the tashkas and stuff that you would never expect in a thousand years to um, uh, to be offering delivery or something like that. Um, <laughs> They unfortunately it's just to just to survive, but it's obviously forced a lot of them to go online or start offering like uh, fancy market produce or something like that, as well as their as well as their takeaway meals, that sort of thing. Interesting. Um, yeah. Um, before we go to your your the final part of your newsletter, which is you know on a lighter note, which I think is great, it's really really nice to end on a positive note. There's another job opportunity here for you, uh, George. Uh, you you can show Hannah around. She's in South London. And, and really desperate to be back in Portugal, but uh, there's a there's a sort of a, a diversification of your work portfolio here if you want it. Uh, and <laughs> she's offering you the chance to show around Lisbon when, when we're allowed to come back. So uh, there, there's an opportunity for you. Um, yeah, before we we uh, came on air, as it were, we were, we were talking about how hard it is to learn Portuguese, and I want to definitely incorporate more in, into the live stream and on the mornings to help people learn Portuguese. Uh, here you've got on a lighter note. Would you mind explaining this uh, particular aspect of your newsletter? Um, this basically, I, I kind of feel like. So, like I was saying, one of, one of my main uh, concerns or thoughts before starting this was whether people actually wanted or were able to endure more coronavirus news because I know it's so all-encompassing. Um, so I thought for anyone that, that was able to kind of put the effort in, spend a couple of minutes um, just finding out the, the basics of what they need to know for the country they're living in, they deserve a bit of, I guess, like a palate cleanser at the end. So I'll just try and find something. Uh, yeah, a little bit lighter, a little bit, um, a little bit. Sometimes it's funny. I, I try and try and spotlight kind of Portuguese businesses or, or um, things like this that that you can you can do that are a little bit a little bit different to um, kind of just kicking back uh, kicking back with Netflix or whatever, which is my default um, most nights. Um, yeah, and th this one obviously is uh, you kind of piggyback on the on the on the um, availability of online classes for kids and um, you can you can jump in for half an hour a day and uh, watch the Portuguese as a foreign language teaching going on there and um, either either really really dig into it and learn and learn it or kind of grasp through a few words or something if you're um, if you if you're sort of only just getting started out that's tremendous that's that's a really good offer so yeah it is it's not uh, by your own admission and with somebody of uh, portuguese heritage for portuguese forefathers you you're uh, uh, saying it's not an easy language to learn you've had to learn in your adult life and um for these estrangeros here um this the least we can do i think to have a go at learning the language so here's a good way of, of doing it supplied by uh, george here george branco with his newsletter for estrangeros for, for the foreigners and uh, i'm curious about uh, this learning channel also says Stephanie. I've been taking lessons from a tutor and watching TV, but this is very interesting. I'm not sure what channel to turn to with my <laughs> NOS cable. That's a very personal request that we'll attempt to uh, deal with. Stephanie, good morning to you. And I have to say to you, George, thank you very much indeed for joining this morning. Thanks for the service you provide. Really appreciate it. I'll make sure the link's available for people. Oh, there it is. Um, georgebranco.substack.com. Substack is a, is a, a very trustworthy um, newsletter. A platform i believe so um that's that's the place to go george thank you so much is there any final words you want to share with the estrangeros here uh no i don't think so just everyone uh stay home keep stay healthy home. okay yeah. thank you so much my friend really appreciate it you're welcome anytime good on you carl thanks so much have a good one
Take care. Have a good day. Uh, yes, doing anything interesting today? <laughs> uh, I think I'll be. Uh, I think I'll be staying at home today. <laughs> All right, mate. Take care. Bye for now. Good on you, mate. Bye. Bye bye. Wonderful. George Branco there. <clears throat> dot Substack dot com. Uh, for his really good newsletter. And like I said before, I tend to go off piste a little bit and um, go into opinion and speculation. George keeps it uh, a bit more factual than me with his fabulous newsletter. So there, subscribe to it there, georgebranco.substack.com. Um, this may be a chance for us to go off piste. Got Will Thompson in the green room, <clears throat> such as it is, limbering up. Uh, just let's let's say hello to everybody. Uh, good morning. To, uh, let, uh, let's have Will join us for this. Uh, Eloise, good morning to you. Stephen, good morning to you. Um, Claire and Steve, of course. Stephanie, who's lost cable we are trying to work out. Uh, Neil Perkins, good morning all from Neil Perkins. Hannah says she missed us all yesterday. Sorry, that was my error. I, I was broadcasting on a different page, wondering where you all were yesterday morning. Uh, there's George's again uh, and I'm sure he, he may well call you on that offer Hannah to show him around um, uh, Lisbon and Stephanie yes, we'll see what we can do we've, we've got to learn this language guys so let's uh, share the best ways of doing that uh, and uh, after your comments about doing tasks around the house and garden I'm pleased to report that my bathroom extractor fan is now installed and working complete with PI activation sensor get you Gary however this did entail a perilous episode of clinging to the outside of the house like a somewhat arthritic mountain goat for a protracted amount of time over a large drop not bad for a bloke with vertigo and a duff knee congratulations and well done Gary would love to see a video of that fantastic uh, welcome to the good morning Portugal live stream well talk Good morning. Good morning, Will. How are yeah. you? I'm okay, thank you. Good. Just woke up, so I'm a bit, a bit fluffy headed still. <laughs> okay. Well, it's going to be the joyless. Good to be the joyless. Uh, I describe you as an activist educator with an incredible mix of anger and compassion. Um, <laughs> I'm yeah. starting to feel like Sherlock Holmes. I'm starting to feel like that. I'm condescending and arrogant and I shouty. And I'm waiting for everyone to catch up with the signs and solve the clues and so on. Oh. Uh, fair play. <laughs> and I'm glad to be your Watson on these episodes. It's looking like it's going to be Thompson Tuesday, so you can ask Will any questions you like. He's one of the biggest tippers in terms of numbers on the Facebook live stream. Uh, we get a lot of people watching that because I think people are interested in what you're saying and doing. You've come up with, I mean, the other day you came up with how to fix this. Yeah. Did, did you see that then? Yeah, I did. I, yeah, and, and um, sorry, my, 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 oh. <laughs> how to, the, the problem you seem to have is how to get that information to a wider audience. We're doing our best here, but you know, what what's the blockage here? How is how do you get that opinion or perception heard elsewhere? I have been trying to phone journalists. I've been trying to phone the universities who are doing this, the studies, and I'm, and no replies, no responses from emails or anything. It's it's very frustrating. Um, there's something you said a day or two ago about, I think the Portuguese were saying we're going to follow the science to, to get back out. And, and you sort of commented, we keep hearing that and I'm starting to lose trust in the, in the science thing. And um, of course I was like, what, what's, well, trust the science, trust the science, but the stuff I've seen over the last few days, I understand now why it's so hard for people to, to have any faith in it. You know, we've been talking about vitamin D and vitamin C for months, right? Absolutely. Well, if you look at the, all the news today is that a few Spanish researchers have decided to investigate vitamin C and vitamin D. And I'm like, what's wrong with the world? Is what's, This cannot be real. We know these are good answers, and they're acting like they've just figured this out. That worries me a lot. And what's the reason? Why is that happening? I, I'm, I'm lost. I really am lost. Um there's so much evidence spanning back decades, even tubercul tuberculosis. Yeah. It was found that people who had it were much better off if they got good sunshine. So yes, there's evidence dating back saying it's great and there's nothing to say it's bad. So why are they just starting to look into it now? It, it, it should have been a, I, I'm, I've been looking for the advice they're giving to doctors and nurses you know, they, they advise how to do PPE and so on, but there's no advice about how to keep your health topped up. I thought that should be like a given. There is a big lack of that. Um, yeah, it's all on the kind of, if I may refer to it as the sort of gloom and doom side and not mm -hmm. so much the prevent, prevention and maintenance side. And, of course, you're right, like sanatorium, uh, sanatoria, 
years ago where places where people went with what they call consumption at the time, right? And they put them out in the fresh air and the sunshine with a blanket on their knees in a sort of, you know, an old fashioned caricature of that. These yes. preventative maintenance things are just not in the forefront. And my now we're in the area of speculation and opinion, and I do, you know, hope that people join us with the comment. We are sitting a little bit with audio apparently, but anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, to me it's because everything is so centralised on the one hand and we're waiting for the singular government to, to tell us what to do and mm. we're, 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 and so the, the localised authority and power is not helpful or not, not influential and if you follow the money, a lot of the solutions are where people are making a big profit, right? It's, yeah, it seems to be. Um... Like this, the idea I had about the, the ACE blockers, these are drugs that are readily available that pretty much block the receptors where the virus can get in. Um, MIT, you know, the smart guys at the big um, university in America, they think they've got a plan. They're really excited about creating molecules, like inventing new things that will lock over the viruses and prevent the keys on the, the proteins on the side of the virus from getting into the receptor but it will take months to design to develop to test and so on and with these blockers i'm talking about the people with hypertension take they would just block the the keyhole up and they're already established so it's a question are they just doing that because they want to make money on their own drug um, it, it's, I'm completely baffled. I thought there was supposed to be a big, big scientific push for humanity, and it, and it doesn't seem to be happening that way. Yeah, maybe you and yeah. are a bit too idealistic. Well, you know that 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 could be a problem here. Um, we apparently it's my sound that's not good, and yours is fine. So I'll just be turning mics on and off um, just to, to see if I can help with that. But questions for Will from the floor, if you like, from from the good folks of the Good Morning Portugal Posse, as I'm. <laughs> We'll refer to you uh, this morning and probably only this morning. Um, any questions for Will at all? If you've seen his videos, you might be prompted to ask um, any questions of him. He does have a, a strong back and, and a very fascinating mind. So do do pile in with your questions for Will. And you've been have you still been fighting off all the kind of conspiracy theory? And I, I really it's like sort of myself polarizing people in this way. But there are some crazy theories, and you do your best to step out there and deal with them head on, right? But it's it's now something that everyone's talking. If you go to John Oliver or the Daily Show, any sort of big, it's even up coming up in the, the newspapers for the UK now. That dis now at this crucial part of the fight, disinformation is one of the most crucial aspects. The most dangerous things is to to stop all that from. Um, from getting out of control. If you look at what's happened in America, people who are marching on the street now, a lot of that's to do with a sense of frustration that they think that Trump's some kind of hero who's going to stop them being oppressed by the deep state. Mm. Um, so people who are worried about the, being a, this is all a big scam to get rid of your human rights and get Bill Gates to come and give you a microchip. A lot of those people, they're, Motivation is largely a factor of that, and that's then putting lives in danger. And that, yeah. for the, for America, that could make the difference between them beating the thing and having to deal with the months and months of hardship. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, please, in we've uh, a number of conversational threads going here. In the old days, hospitals would burn rosemary and thyme as fumigation disinfectant against disease. We we have essential oil vaporizers that could do the same. And I have to say, you do see these um, sort of warnings in social media groups. Do not suggest, you know, these remedies to do with crystals or anything like that. But I think, you know, like, why not discuss these things like rosemary and thyme and, and aromatherapy and, and discuss them and, and, and see if it's work? You know, we're not, you know, no one's going to claim it's suddenly the cure for all, you know, hum humanity ill. But surely every, everything's valid in a discussion and, and a respectful consideration. <laughs> Things like what your man Gary's just mentioned, essential oils and so on. Um, and if you talk about things like garlic, all those things, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's not hocus pocus. I mean, there are chemicals inside plants and so on that become medicine because they are useful. Um, so like, the, what, what was he just saying, the, the essential oil, rosemary and things, a lot of them are antibacterial. Mm -hmm. And in the case of coronavirus, one of the issues is a secondary bacterial infection. And since that stuff doesn't hurt, it's not going to hurt, then, yeah, why not? Yeah. 
Uh, and I, I think modern medics are a bit loath to sort of recommend these things, aren't they? Because it seems a little bit unprofessional and difficult to just, you know, go off piece with, with, with these wacky sounding suggestions. Yeah, that is, it's it. They risk well, being poo poo. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mute my mic. Um, I'll mute your first and I'll read this out. There is also so much question about ventilators versus oxygen treatment earlier and that ventilators aren't necessarily working. I realize this is a US article, but it seems curious that some, okay, the 1% have recovered so quickly. Uh, your view on that? Um, well, in terms of using a ventilator, um, we know now <laughs> it's obvious that this virus uh, influenza gets to here remember we said it gets to your it goes either upper or lower respiratory tract but coronavirus goes for the bits at the bottom so with influenza if you end up on a rest a ventilator it can get oxygen down through the tubes that are infected and get it to the bottom but in the case of this virus if it's lining the bottom of your lungs trying to push oxygen down with a ventilator it really doesn't help that much because even if it gets to the bottom, the, the, the actual cells that are exchanging the oxygen um, don't work anyway. Um, and then, of course, if you start sticking the ventilator down, you increase the chance of um, bacterial infections and damage and so on. And this is where things like the essential oils. Um, uh, there's, there's one of my friends is looking at antibacterial teas, lemon teas and so on. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> well, we'll find out from Stephanie, certainly. Um, you have brought some, well, you sent me a series of graphs. Do you want to talk through these as well? I'll keep my mic down if you talk through them. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, this one goes back to the, the bad science. Um, this is from an article that was released in the Daily Mail yesterday. They had gone to a professor from Oxford who is an expert in um, influenza, apparently. And I read it. His argument is that if you look at this data, this is all the, all the GPs in the UK reporting flu symptoms and how when we got to the washing hands and then lockdown, how suddenly all those numbers dropped. His argument is that that is proof that we peaked in COVID before the lockdown happened. So therefore, the lockdown is useful. OK, but if you look at that, graph, the line at the bottom, the blue one, that is just people who reported feeling a bit crappy, who had a high temperature. The red one is, I think, lower. Yeah, lower track. So people who had a really bad sort of pneumonia like influenza. And the one at the top yellow one is most people who came in and said, I've got a sore throat and and so on. Now, when everyone if you look towards the two lines where this where, where everything starts to drop, that is when everybody realized there was a some flu, there was something bad coming and everyone became more aware. People started washing their hands more. And then when the lockdown started, within those two short days, we pretty much destroyed flu, normal influenza, in a matter of days. Um, and that's what the graph is actually showing. Mm. What bothered me was <laughs> this is being put out into the public and it's completely wrong. There's, he's saying that that was COVID doing all that. And that's that's therefore encouraging people to to fight against the lockdown. Uh huh. Uh -huh. You see what I mean? I do. I do. I do. Yeah, that's why I pointed it out. So, <laughs> I think everyone everyone sort of had a crash course in science and graphs and things over the last few months. So, um, yeah, feel free to have a look at that. Read, find the article if you want um, in the Daily Mail, and look what he's trying to say. Um, how I tried to phone the the. The journalists and say why are you putting this stuff out this is dangerous this is bad science going on how can it be allowed to just put put this stuff out in the public i can't believe the daily mail would do something like that right there's another question here um yes uh vitamin d supplements uh, yes. if you can if you google you'll you sort of you'll see how much um There'll be recommendations if for depending on your circumstances. Uh, it, I think to get enough from the sun is about three times a week. And they recommend midday sun and as much skin as possible for about 20 minutes. Uh, and if you put on sunscreen, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so if you can only get sun, I mean, the sun seems to be the safest way. Your body will regulate how, how much you're getting. But if you feel like you're not getting enough, 
it's hard to get out in the sun, then absolutely take the, the vitamin D supplements. And I believe the recommended dosage on the su- on the, the bottles assume you're not getting enough sunshine. Okay. So Thank you for that. Don't, don't go Nothing overboard on don't get, don't get loads of sun and then take loads of vitamin D. That's a bit too much. Okay. Do you end up looking like Donald Trump if you do that? Huh. <laughs> no, I, think, I think it can actually make you sick. It starts, uh, your liver doesn't like, it can't process it, something like that. Okay, easy going on the vitamin D. Uh, active cases in Sweden, the, the Sweden phenomenon. Talk us through that with this graph, Will. Okay, uh, you know, a lot of people are now trying to compare things to Sweden and say, look at them, they're doing okay. And they didn't do lockdown, so why are we doing lockdown? But if you look at the graph, they didn't do lockdown, and it's not they're not getting they're not getting the R naught back down again to zero. I hope it's coming soon. But um, if you compare the Sweden numbers to say the UK, the Swedish numbers overall are much lower. But the Swedish have had a program of fortifying foods with vitamin D since 2016. They know about vitamin D deficiency because they're up there so far north. So they already got a relatively healthy and well-educated public on those things. So in terms of sheer numbers, they are doing not too bad. But the fact that they didn't go into lockdown properly means they're not managing to um, flatten the curve. They're, they're flattening it, but they're not like in Portugal now and other a lot of Eastern European countries were going back towards zero. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Be careful when you hear people trying to argue that Sweden are doing fine. Okay, and this is the thing here, isn't it, is to not take any st- any kind of article or, or input of information in isolation. And this is what you do so well, Will, is to balance all these things up in, in a big picture rather than just picking the bit of information, as most of us seem to do, the bit that we like, and saying, well, that's why we need to lift the lockdown, because of this article or another article or the opposite view with, with, with the same article even. Well, I would say if, if, a, if a journalist or a paper is saying an expert, like one guy, an expert said this, like, take it with a pinch of salt. If they've just gone to one guy with a theory, I'm starting to worry a lot of these you know, scientists, professors might just want a bit of limelight. I don't know, but they're com- happy to come up with these mad theories and then it's printed as fact. Um, but the second thing I discovered, yes, I, it just clicked on me yesterday. Um, you can divide the two camps, the anti-science and the science, the people who are trying to be sensible and wholesome about their data gathering, and then the other ones. And the difference is if you hear someone calling it Corona, then you can tell what they've been reading. If they're calling it SARS COVID two or COVID nineteen, they tend to be looking at the more scientific stuff. It's just a good good way to figure. It. If you hear them say Corona, they're trying to convince you it's not as bad as it actually is. All right, next slide that you've sent to me for this one. Oh yeah, that's that was the end of my investigation into how the virus, how where it's probably come from. You know, Trump wants to investigate, the UK investigating, and people at home are trying to investigate uh, to find out where this fire, did it come out through the lab or not? Um, and I had this eureka moment about a week ago, and I said, I think it ended up, I think the intermediary animal might have been cats, because, well, one, we know that cats can get infected. Um, so I checked. Now, do you remember back Really early on, there was a bit of, it was a really sad story because the, some, in Wuhan, some officials went around with megaphones telling everyone to round up their pets because they're going to cull all the pets. And I was furious. I'm like, what, why would they be doing that? Um, but the, now they've actually tested all the cats in the, or a lot of cats in the area. And it's true, the cats in the local area had, have antibodies. And so it looks like, the cats in the area may have been the zoonotic, um, the animal that made the jump from bats to cats. Uh, so that you may find out over the coming months that, that you'll hear more and more it was the cats that did it. Um, so, sounds like an episode of Scooby-Doo. Um, no. Okay, um, whilst I find the next slide, and I think the final one, a question mm-hmm. here from, um, from Steve, I think, Will... How long do you think it will be before the UK's borders will be open again? 
Uh, whereas the UK at the moment is has, the curve is flattened. They're plateaued now, haven't they? Um, it's really difficult to say now. Can they hang on for another two or three weeks to get back down to zero and open up? It depends on the will of the people, the collective will. And I don't think, I think everyone's really frustrated and groups are quite divided. Um, and as we know, the collective action of the whole the whole country in each individual country determines how fast and how well that works. Um, it's why I want everyone to try and work together. Um, so I'm very frustrated now about that. But I really couldn't say, but I know it's, it's not going to be for another two or three weeks at least. Yeah. They may they may have to start coming up with um I don't know selective strategies for various people or having a case of you can move across the border as long as there's a you know a two week quarantine thing or have the tests ready. Um, I'm guessing uh, Stephen wants to know if he can travel or get back to his missus or something. But yeah, I'm sorry, I, I really don't know. Okay. okay. Um, the, to find you, Will, uh, Dawn says here, um, yeah, we all missed each other yesterday, and you, it sounds like you had a lovely time in Continent on your own. It's one of the upsides. Uh, literally uh, had the place to themselves. Hi, Will, can't find you on Facebook to follow. Can you put a link up, please? Will, is it all right if I share the link to your personal uh, profile? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, I took the liberty of uh, preparing before will.thompson.505 um, is where you can find Will on Facebook and see the incredible conversations he has with people. Last screen to share with you, Will. Another graph on its side, though. I don't know how useful this is going to be. <laughs> oh, that, I, um, that's just some collated data for how flu season uh, affects us year after year. You see those waves? That's winter, summer, winter, summer waves coming. Um, and you can see in the past where it flew, the, the ones lower down are older people and the one at the top is the children. So they're barely affected at all. But the lower down you go, you see that flu does, um, does affect you older people more. And the one at the end now, you can see how flu season was getting bad. And suddenly with the lockdowns and stuff, we kind of stopped it. But then all the deaths from COVID started shooting up again um, instead. Okay. To draw from that, uh, just yeah, that um, pretty much the science about the the fact that flu season was actually we actually managed to beat that through a, a common effort. Um, oh, and that was that was my positive take yesterday. I was having a big rant and so on, but it, it really occurred to me, despite all the frustrations and feel like we've not managed to achieve anything. Do you remember the big scare at the start is that the hospitals would be overrun. Um, so we can all give ourselves a big, big pat on our back and say we, we've managed to just get together and do this thing just in time. And it looks like the, the hospitals are going to cope. So well done on that one. That was the big game. That was the big, big goal. We all need to work together to save the hospitals. Well, I think we all did it. Nice one. Well, yeah, and I, I do love your mix of uh, positivity and sort of downright anger and negativity sometimes. Uh, that's why we have you here. And that's what Thompson Tuesday is all about on the Good Morning Portugal stream. Uh, Steve says, unfortunately, well, my wife's here with me. So he just needs to know when he can fly back on his own by the sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Right now, it looks like America, America's, they've just shut down all immigration and holidays and things. Um. I think the future is going to be divided countries for for a long time where you have some countries that have got clear and are working on being able to, to get back on their feet. And you'll have un other countries that for months are going to be really struggling. Um, so I imagine there is going to be an ongoing um, border issue between places. But it looks like Europe's really working together. Um, Certainly on the mainland. I hope Britain can, <laughs> wants to come back and join in as well. That would be nice. But, um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, well, um, just finally then, let's wrap up here. Uh, we need to be more concerned about PPE not being available, herd immunity. Will the UK throw us out there? And would that be a good thing? Um, why? That's my question. Would that be a good thing? Why won't the UK government go to private companies for PPE? This is opening up a new uh, hornet's nest potentially, but your view, Will? <laughs> Um, my view on the masks is that they they definitely work 
if we're all doing it, if we're all going out in public and everyone's using a mask, then it absolutely works. Um, however, in places like the UK where there really is a shortage, it's not ideal for us to all start going around and trying to buy masks because it just makes it worse for the, the hospitals. So the best solution is us all to work on making our own. There's lots of ideas out there and using, making some for yourself and then using them in public. Okay. Uh, why are the UK government's not, they've, they've done a terrible job, haven't they, of getting, um, sourcing the equipment. I don't know if things are getting better now. It doesn't sound like it. Why won't they go to private companies? Yeah. You tell me, why, 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 why not? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to be having a, a, a spokesperson for the UK government on here anytime soon. And uh, pretty much universally, um, most people, uh, I think, are seeing that it's a pretty bad job. And the, the big problem, of course, I think, for, for the UK government is that they just don't, won't seem to accept any responsibility. They just seem to be presenting this robotic line of like what people should do rather than answering any questions, like saying, we screwed up. Uh, and, you know, let's see what we can do together to figure this out. Sorry, I turned your mic off there to stop the echo, but he would not say about that, Will. Yeah, they're in denialism all the time, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Refusing to admit mistakes. I don't know if that's some sort of a social psychology thing, to refuse to admit anything is wrong. Yeah. Um, People want to, a lot of, half the people are saying, hey, we're doing great, well done, Boris, we're glad he's okay. And other people are saying we have to kick them all out now, like have an inquiry and kick them all out. But clearly that can't happen in the middle of a, of a in a situation like this. Um, well, at least yeah. about the better probably at the moment. Um, I, I think we should conclude there. Uh, a, a last word from Jeannie in Belgium, I believe, where... We might take uh, this as a thread for a, a further discussion because I know you're really into the preventative side, Will. You know, you're, you're very rounded in your view, and that's why it's so refreshing to have you here. Uh, CBD oil can also boost your immune system, and not only now in these times. And there are all sorts of things that can do that. So maybe on Nick Thompson, next Thompson Tuesday, we can uh, look at the preventative and, and sort of maintenance side of things and all the things you can do at home and all the things, arguably, we should be doing for the future anyway. So how does that sound to you, Will? Uh, that's great. I mean, I just what Janine said, the CBD oil and hemp, uh, things like that are things that I would really like to see in the future. Um, so much good stories or information you hear about CBD oil. So I've not looked too deep myself or I don't really go down there, but so much. What's the word? Uh, yeah, a lot of positive things I hear about that. So, yeah. Yes. And, and a, a belated happy 420 day. To everybody around the world group for yesterday connected with CBD there. Uh, thank you very much everyone for joining us. Thank you especially to you, Will, to Steve and Claire, to Dawn, to Neil, Jeannie, just in there, Eloise, Gary, everyone who's joined us. Last word to you, Will. Um, I understand that we're they're talking about the first of May, relaxing. The yeah, the emergency. And we're gonna start to go out again. And about yeah, so it's remember about five, six days ago I said it's about ten days. So yeah, we're we're on the home stretch now. We're nearly there. All right, fantastic. Well I'll speak I look forward to it. Thanks all. Bye for now. <laughs>